So let me just welcome everyone to the session. Um, we've got some troubles here at the Auckland Room, so we're using someone's laptop. So in a second, I'll spin it around and there are some people here. But let me just say thank you all for being here. Thank you for the speakers for devoting your time. The next hour, we're talking about tips, tricks, experiences of networking. Um, I take it as given that networking is important to lots of professional jobs, but it appears to be particularly important in research related fields and within the university sector in particular. But it's often this somewhat amorphous, somewhat scary, somewhat imposing thing to do. And we wanted to get some people um, involved in this session that would have some stories, some experiences, some tricks that they've learnt along the way about how one does networking. So we're gonna hear from each of those speakers. They'll talk for a little while and we might go Joel, Pansy, James in that order, if that's okay. And then we'll open it up to the, the virtual floor, as it were, and the audience members can ask their own questions of the panelists. So please excuse in advance the inherent awkwardness that goes with Zoom uh, meetings. There's often sort of big gaps until we wait for someone to ask a question and until someone figures out they, they'd like to answer it. So I'll just say that in advance. Um, but first of all, we might get Joel to tell us a bit about your experiences and tricks networking. I'll spin the computer around and then we can go from there. Okay, hi, I'm Joel and I've been an introvert for years. <laughs> Actually, that's not probably true. It's not really true. Uh, I think I'm more like a a Jekyll and Hyde and uh, my wife and my close friends confirm this as well so actually the Hyde is quite appropriate because there's definitely social situations that I get into where that's actually the thing that I want to do is go off and hide and I do go off and hide often um, and those are kind of very weird situations and I find myself you know almost sitting above myself when I'm kind of giving people monosyllabic answers and, uh, and just generally behaving like I've got quite bad Asperger's syndrome. And there's nothing I can ever do to turn those situations around. You know, it's like the Titanic and, and I just have to kind of get away from those situations. And they definitely happen. But then there's other times where at least I've been told that I'm kind of moderately normal and sociable and gregarious and all of those other things. I haven't really figured out yet, and I've been trying to think about it, you know, preparing for this, what drives one or the other of those situations. So I haven't really been able to rectify it that well, but at least I can recognize that sometimes it happens and I can try and bail out as, as quickly as I can and reduce the amount of damage. Uh, now, having said all of that, uh, I mean, I, as Thomas said, obviously it's very, you know, it's important to know people in, in, in this line of work. I feel, I do feel like it, it's all been built up into a bit of a thing, you know, called networking. And I mean, really it's just talking to people, acting like, you know, you're a kind of roughly normal human being, the things we do all the time. I don't think we really have to invest quite such a dramatic sort of characterization of this networking thing that maybe we do. Um, I mean, I think most, you know, most of us have some friends, some acquaintances, and, and really the networking is no more than making some more friends and acquaintances that just happen to be at work rather than, you know, at your tennis club or whatever. Uh, so maybe don't make too much out of it, I guess. Which, of course, is exactly what we're doing by having a networking webinar. But anyway, um, I definitely do have some strategies, though. Uh, that, that's, that's true. That's definitely the case. I mean, I think one of the... So I, I guess I try and identify, you know, when it is going to be useful to, to meet people particularly. And, and I think almost always, for me, it, it doesn't work if it's some sort of mingling thing where everyone's got a name tag and a you know a drink with a umbrella in it or something it's almost always situations where there's just one or two people that i'm talking to and 
maybe, and that could be part of this sort of my the hide part of the Jekyll and Hyde is when it gets there's too many people and there's too much happening. I kind of switch off a little bit, and it definitely works much better when it's just me and one or two other people. So what are the, I mean, we get those situations all the time, and I guess I I do try and sort of engineer those situations. Um, in science, at least, I mean, I can't speak for the other other kind of academic areas, but often people come and give seminars in our department. And the person that hosts the seminar is always desperate to find people to speak with the speaker after their talk or before their talk or to go to lunch with them or whatever. And almost always no one ever wants to do it. Everyone's busy and so forth. But I try and almost always be one of the people that, that speaks with the speaker. Uh, and it's then you get a controlled situation, right? There's just you and there's the speaker. You've always got 30 minutes and then there's, a, you know, something and then there's another person they have to go and meet. So there's a definite end to the, you know, to the thing. You can, of course, look the person up beforehand and, you know, do the usual amount of Google stalking to find out what they do, what they're interested in, find some overlap uh, with what you do. And then... And then uh, you know, you've got something to talk about, right? And, and as always, and as all the kind of, as soon as you Google networking for introverts, you know, there's 50 articles that you read about how you do it. Say that an important thing is to ask people about themselves because everyone likes talking about themselves. And I guess, and that is definitely what I do. I always try and, you know, get people talking about the things they're interested in because usually that's the best way to find out if there's any overlap with what you're interested in. Um, and so those half hour things are quite good for doing that, uh, I think. I mean, if I'm at conferences, I guess my strategy is, I have a couple of strategies. One is that I try and often ask questions in the, in the talks, and that's a way of sort of introducing yourself to the speaker in a way, but also sort of introducing yourself to the other people in the audience. And, you know, they find out a little bit about who you are and, uh, you know, you can, it may be easier to make connections with them afterwards if they say oh that was an interesting question you asked and I was thinking the same thing or something like that and it's also a good way then to be able to speak to the speaker afterwards if you've asked them a question or you've saved up a couple of questions and you you can ask them at morning tea or something like that um, and probably the last thing I'll say because I don't want to spend the whole time to give the other speakers a little bit of time is I think that the other part of networking that's really important for us is to network with the public. And I mean, to, in a way that's, you know, that's probably almost the most critical thing. If we want the world to be, at least, you know, from out from the perspective of me being a scientist, if we want everyone to be more scientifically literate, then the better that we're able to communicate with people out in the rest of the world, then the more likely it is that people are gonna engage with science and that sort of thing. So I always have my kind of, my little pitch, of, you know, that people talk about the elevator pitch thing. And it's definitely true for me. I have a kind of one minute and a two minute and a five minute version of what I do that's kind of targeted, at, not at what interests me necessarily about it, but at what I think would interest someone in the general public or whoever I'm talking to about it and try and kind of pitch that to people. And that's a way that I can, instead of asking people about themselves, it's a way I can kind of project a little bit about what I'm excited about and you know sometimes that sort of can start kickstart the conversation as well I think that's probably most of the things I wanted to say so maybe I'll give the other speakers a chance to say something now sure thanks Joel that's great very helpful and now we've switched to a larger screen and we can see your strategically placed bit of New Zealand artwork well done. <laughs> so you might hand over to Pansy to give us some comments now uh, thank you very much, Tom, um, and thanks, Joel. That was that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I I, I guess um, in terms of the the theme of the, the panel, this uh, the, the the notion of networking for introverts, essentially, I I think I I, I qualify as an introvert, um, in, because I I find um, social situations not not terrifying, just kind of tiring and unpleasurable um, a lot of the time when I, you know, when I don't know people uh, very well. Um, but at the same time, I guess um, I also want to just, just chiming in with what John just mentioned. Um, 
I would want to push back against the, the kind of overestimation or overrating or overvaluation of, of networking um, within academia in the sense that, um, you know, it, it kind of gives the impression that we, that you, you can't succeed in academia unless you are kind of actively networking kind of quite relentlessly when in fact I think we, we our profession is one in which it, I guess in general the conditions are quite hospitable to being kind of, um, to being an introvert. Um, um, partly because of the, the peer review process, you know, we do have this sort of bottom line that means that it really is about the quality of your work. Um, but um, but also, I guess, because, um, and this is something that I've been thinking about recently, I think, in terms of the uh, sort of networks that I have formed, um, they they haven't really involved, or, or the, the networks that to me seem the most valuable, they haven't necessarily involved me. I'm actively kind of networking my way into them. You know, they've, they've arisen um, really through through my work um, and through receiving invitations um, to collaborate with you. So, so I don't know. I, I sort of I like the idea that you can kind of passively network, or or that you can kind of allow you know get other people to do the networking for you by just doing good work and um, and um, getting other people to run around and, and to kind of and send the invitations because um, that's yeah it's not necessarily a part of the job but um that I find pleasurable but um yeah I think I think and you can kind of outsource <laughs> that aspect of the job to some extent um but also that in terms of being you know as an introvert you you almost by definition have a huge advantage over um other people in the sense that um probably enjoy solitary activities like writing um which extroverts um really um often don't they um so i think yeah i would sort of try and leverage or exploit that that tray in yourself rather than um think of it as a as a as a problem that needs to be overcome um but um yeah um in terms of in terms of like a actively working though i mean obviously i do you know there is i do think you know see value in it and i have found um it occasions where I've sort of actively reached out to people um, in kind of conference situations or via email, um, useful. Um, and in terms of how I might go about that or what kind of strategies inform what I do. Um, uh, so first of all, in terms of, you know, who I might might be kind of get, try and get in, in contact with. Um, uh, it really, um, I guess the, the kinds of connections that I've um, found valuable involve connections with people who are really, you know, who, and who are essentially working in a similar vein to you. So it's, I think there's a, there's often when, when people talk about networking, they often talk about kind of forming connections with, with senior scholars, say, whereas in fact it's the, the connections that seem really valuable in terms of um, collaboration have tended to be um, people who are at the same career stage as me, people who are kind of can be peers and collaborators. Um, Although obviously senior scholars um, can can be useful in terms of functioning as referees and um, and reviewers and so on and and, and can help kind of um, assist you with your work. Um, but yeah, the, the it's your peers who are really um, the the best kind of points of contact. Um, and and yeah, people who are working in your field. But um, yeah, in terms of in terms of conferencing. Um, I guess my yeah, like if, if if I'm thinking about how I've made the most of those sort of occasions where I'm required to sort of be in social situations, um, one of the things that I've found useful is to make sure that when I go to a conference, I always go as part of a kind of pre-constituted panel, rather than just um you know submit a paper and and have it sort of slotted in anywhere because. First of all, it kind of supplies you with this like um, baked in kind of friend group, like you have people who are duty bound to hang out with you. Um, but then you also, you know, you, you're guaranteed to get more out of the conference in terms of um, uh, overlapping um, lines of inquiry and you can kind of curate the conference yourself. Um, and and this is and and yes, yeah, something that I, I constantly think I should do, but but really never have is is as you were saying, Joel, kind of. Um, I, you know, identify in advance people who you want to connect with. Um, I tend to be like very haphazard about it um, and, and just spend time with people I feel comfortable with. But I know in the future, I really want to make sure that I um, go through the program and, and, and identify people who I'd like to, to connect with and, and kind of maybe Google them properly and, and so on. 
but but yeah in terms of in, in terms of how you kind of <laughs> how you might like socialize with a conference I, I agree with like I I tend to do a similar thing of just um getting people to talk about themselves academics are very lonely um forlorn people who like <laughs> always feel starved for attention and and um and and praise and 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 interest and so yeah I think it's it, it, um, it's definitely a good way of, of ensuring that you, you you kind of keep the conversation going and that people sort of think well of you afterwards. Um, the more the more they remember um, listening to the sound of their own voice, the, the more they're going to um, feel like they had a, had a good time. Um, uh, and yeah, and I guess the other thing that I found is that um, in terms of making connections, that that. And this sort of goes hand in hand with what I was suggesting before about academics being like even even the most sort of uh, well known or prominent academics, really just being quite well not necessarily lonely souls, but you know it, p people who we experience as sort of leaders um, in their field or famous, you know they're really um, they're well known in in a relatively small coterie of people, and so if you get in touch with them, they're they're going to to respond well. I've never been in touch with. Um, with a scholar and uh, you know and, and and someone who I've really um, who I really feel strongly about and want to kind of engage with or connect with and I've, I've never been in touch with a scholar um, in that way and, and had a negative response or, or, or even had no response like I, I think um, academics are very keen to engage with people who they feel like you know appreciate um, their work and so I feel like yeah, in terms of kind of making those connections, it's kind of it's okay to to kind of cold email people. Um, and I've I've made like one of my mentors at the moment is someone who I just I, I was pivoting into a new field. Um, and so my earlier mentors really weren't um, capable of, of guiding me in the way that they might once have been. So I just um, emailed this so it's professor in the US and um, and asked him to serve as a referee for a for a um, grant application I was doing and. And since then, we've kind of I've sent him some work to prove to to read over, and 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 he sent me one of his drafts, and it's become a kind of um, relationship. And I don't, yeah, and I think that's simply because, um, yeah, even the kind of the, the loftiest academic figures are, are kind of relatively um, isolated in their own sort of intellectual territory, and and really welcome um, immediate you know engagement from someone um, who, who who's familiar with their work. Um, and yeah, what else can I say? Um, um, oh, just one thing that I did recently that I'd never thought of doing. I, I had a um, my my supervisor actually suggested this to me. Is um, I had a article go through the peer review process, and um, the peer reviewer ultimately revealed herself her name at the end because she liked the article and she wanted her name to be disclosed. And um, my supervisor uh, told me that I should get in touch with her. Um, and I would not have done that had I not been advised. So I guess the other lesson here is like, make sure that your supervisor is, um, you know, marvelous, but it's probably too late for all of us <laughs> at this stage. But, um, but yeah, she, she said, just get in touch with her. And now this, this uh, woman is, um, uh, you know, again, a kind of mental figure and someone that I can turn to and, and, and who can function as a referee and um, who I imagine will, will see further uh, work of mine in the future as it goes through other review processes so um yeah so that that's all i i really have to say um yeah thank you very much thanks Pansy. that adds very nicely to joel's comments and now we'll hand over to james and james we're particularly excited about your involvement in the panel because you've spanned the academic non-academic divide and i'm guessing all of the audience members here Will be coming from the university context, but they'll, they'll be contemplating careers outside of the university, and you might have some perspectives on the intersection of non-university careers and networking that might you might bring up in your comments. So over to you, James. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Cool. Uh, no, that's really good perspectives to hear from both um, Joel and Pansy. And as as Tom said, I, I did spend. Um, kind of a, a few years going down the academic pathway, um, attended conferences, did all the networking there, attended seminars, all that kind of thing. Um, and I, I left and, and thought I would get away from networking, but didn't because now I'm in a business environment where the networking in that kind of context is 
I would say same, but different. Um, it's, you have the same kind of objectives, the same environments, you get the same kind of anxiety as an introvert, how you're going to kind of um, plant yourself into these social situations and get what you want out of them. Um, but at the same time, the strategies that I think are applicable to both acad uh, networking academia are, this, are, are the same um, in industry. Um, what I was going to kind of talk about today was more around, um, yeah, like basically my approach to networking. Um, I am quite strongly introverted. I do get anxious thinking about attending events and talking to people who are a lot smarter than me, a lot better at what they do. Um, I worry about kind of like, yeah, being judged, saying something stupid, that kind of thing, which I'm sure all of us would um, be worried about. But, um, and so I guess I kind of, and also my background's in engineering. So I kind of break down my approach in kind of like a, a more systematic way of approaching it. Um, and I kind of have three phases in, in networking. Um, so the first is the, the kind of the preparation phase where you're, where you've got an event coming up or something that you're going to, where you know that there's going to be networking. Um, and this kind of uh, reiterates what both Joel and Pansy said in, in that you want to identify what you want to get out of it. So either finding the people that you want to talk to, um, or at least identifying or figuring out why you're putting yourself in the situation and what you want to, um, what you want to get out of the people that you're meeting there, whether it's uh, more collaboration, collaboration partners, um, people to help you run trials, whether it's a business venture, um, what do you want to do? And then look at the types, the types of people who are attending um, and kind of pare down a list to maybe a few people that you want to try and approach because you have to kind of set realistic um, expectations that you're not going to talk to everyone there. And so you want to make efficient use of your time. Um, the other thing is that you want to, um, yeah, do the, do the background stalking, the Googling. Um, that really helps if you can talk about things that have shown that you do have an interest in the person that you're talking to um, and have done some of the legwork leading up to it. Um, the other thing I would suggest is if you're going with a friend, um, they can also help reduce that anxiety, especially um, if, you, if you're going to something where you don't know anyone for sure. Um, having someone there that you do know can help with that, um, particularly from the, if they're in the same field. Um, so once you've done that, kind of the, the next phase is the actual then the networking itself. Um, and I always kind of approach it as it's it is it is networking. You're not you're not going to develop deep and meaningful relationships at this event. Um, the purpose at this time is to kind of introduce yourself to the person that you're interested in, um, share a little bit of rapport, build a, start building a relationship, but then you're going to do most of that afterwards. Um, what I tend to do is if I meet someone that I am interested in, uh, I will sort of introduce a bit what, I, what, I, what I'm doing, what I'm interested in, what I want to get from them kind of as a two-way thing, and then try and schedule up a follow-up meeting um, afterwards so over coffee, um, outside of, so say if, the, if you're at a conference outside of session times in, in one of your downtimes, um, if it's a business thing for me, I'll arrange coffee somewhere in the city. Um, but that at least gives you that one-on-one um, -on -one time, which is where an introvert flourishes. When you have those small groups that you can um, communicate and, and talk directly and it, it's where you're most comfortable. Um, and and it's, it's getting to that point that is the most difficult, um, particularly when you're in an environment where it's noisy, there's lots of people around, everyone's talking in groups and you're not quite sure how to um, insert yourself into a conversation, how to attract attention. Those, those I think, are the main um, miles or barriers that tend, you tend to need to overcome um, at a networking event. Um, unfortunately, some of the strategies that I have anyway, that I've learned to kind of deal with those, are uh, mostly around having to be less of an introvert and be a, a bit more pushy, a bit more putting yourself out there. Um, and it, it is difficult to do at first, but it's something that um, I think it gets easier with practice and the more that you do it, um, but it's definitely something that you do need to learn. Um, and I, I mean, even, even as an example, at a, at a network event, um, you might go around and use a few people for practice 
Um, like if you've, if you've targeted people that you do want to talk to, don't talk to them first, go talk to someone else and just kind of get warmed up, get into the flow of things and, and sort of start building rapport with, um, I'd say less important people. Um, but then when you're feeling more comfortable and more relaxed in this environment, then you go on and, and talk to the people that you're, that you're actually there for. Um, probably a less, uh, in, a, in a similar vein, um, you can try and do things before the event that helps you to relax to reduce that anxiety. So for example, for me, I like to run. I find it quite meditative and I find it like a mindful practice. So maybe before a networking event in the evening, I might go for a run beforehand and that helps to relax me. Um, the other alternative to that is alcohol. Some of them do have alcohol. I wouldn't recommend you ever do it, but anything that kind of helps you to relax and, and feel a bit more comfortable is going to be helpful as long as it doesn't impair your judgment. Um, and so kind of, yeah, once you've, the other thing for me is to be aware of the kind of environment that you are networking in. Um, I have, so for example, I have quite a, a deep voice, um, that becomes difficult to hear in, uh, locations with bad acoustics and a lot of background noise. My voice tends to kind of fade into that noise. So I end up yelling a lot, um, to be heard. And that's particularly difficult when you're talking to a group of say five or six people in a circle and, and only half of that group can hear you, then it kind of, um, people lose interest quite quickly. It's hard to maintain a conversation, hard to maintain good dialogue. Um, so those, in those kinds of situations, you want to try and identify like uh, places in the room where that's less of an issue or at least try and um, target smaller groups of people. Um, so kind of strategies that, you can try and employ to increase your chances of success. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's very much uh, a, a event that you're trying to go to to get something out of it. So you want to um, try and do that as, do what you can to um, yeah, reduce not getting anything out of it. Um, and so, yeah, and then, and then once you've um, sort of built a little bit of rapport, you've exchanged details with someone, then it's, then the onus is really on you to follow up after the event to cement that relationship. So that proposal of coffee or follow up um, or whatever is where you then get down and really do the, um, the, the grunt work in, in developing this relationship, um, regardless of what you want to get out of it. But that's, that's kind of, um, and, and if you've, if, if you've managed to present yourself well initially, um, to talk about what you're interested in, manage to captivate that person's interest, then it, it makes that follow up a lot easier, particularly if you are um, memorable, because most networking events, you meet tons of people, um, you tend to forget faces and who talked about what. And so if you do follow up soon after, then you kind of, um, your impression, imp making an impression um, on the person that, that you're interested in. So that's, um, well worth it too. Um, yeah, and because you're because you're meeting so many people, and and it's, it's most of the time it's not that memorable. Um, in terms of what I sort of started off with, in terms of anxiety and sort of worried about making mistakes and sounding silly, um, people won't really remember. And in a lot of these kind of like conferences, you'll see these people people once and then maybe never again. And so it's um, don't you don't need to be so concerned um, about that sort of thing um, and really the the way to get better is to just practice so practice talking to people practice um, having conversations about what you do um, practice entering and leaving conversations like if you're seeing a group of people talking and you want to join in to introduce yourself um, how to wait for lulls in conversation or or jump into the conversation without being rude. Um, all those kinds of things just kind of take practice. Um, it's not something you can read a book and then figure out how to do. It's kind of, it's, it's a combination of environment, reading body language, um, just kind of understanding the ebbs and flows of conversation. Um, and then, yeah, as introverts, we're good listeners. So as, as Joel and, and Pansy have both said before, it's if you can make them talk about themselves, that's good. But otherwise, um, listening to what they say and coming up with questions that sound well thought out um, like you're actually engaging with them helps to build that rapport so yeah um, 
is a clinician. This is incredibly clinical. It's amazing kind of uh, set of, you know, well thought out. You can tell he's an engineer. <laughs> he's got a blueprint for it. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, there's, like, there's like a systematic diagram or flowchart in my head that I go through and make decisions as I go and like, nope, this, this, is, a, this is the thing, move on. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's kind of pretty much what I thought I'd, I'd share. Um, very much looking forward to discussing things further and especially sort of um, picking apart maybe what problems that or, or issues that people might want to explore. Um, further um yeah thanks james that was excellent and thank you to all the presenters for your insights and good thing now we have some time for opening it up to the audience if you've been thinking about questions that you might have but now would be the time so i'll we'll stop talking in a couple of seconds and put it over to you so would anyone have a question they might want to ask the panel Marie? yes great <laughs> Um, thank you all. I got a lot out of that. Um, it was good to hear that, and you all said it, that it's good to get other people talking. Um, I enjoy hearing other people talk, but I always seem to, when I get really awkward, is when I have to talk about my research. And Joel, you mentioned one thing about coming up with an elevator speech. I wondered if anybody else had ideas about how just making that task easier about not getting so caught up and self-conscious when talking about your own research or whatever. I mean, I, I think, I mean, presumably you're excited about what you do because that's why you're doing it. And, you know, to me, the main thing, the thing everyone likes when someone else is speaking is to have that person be excited about whatever they're talking about, passionate or whatever. I mean, I think you just have to let it flow a little bit, you know, to, to get that sort of passion across to people. And, but to me, the other critical part of it, whether it's a networking thing or giving a lecture or whatever you're doing, and I think the thing that often people don't do so well is identifying the person that you're talking to and what they know and what they don't know so that you can pitch whatever you're, you know, you can tell people in, in your excited way about whatever it is you want to tell them, but tell them at a level that's appropriate for them. And, you know, maybe, I mean, I, my understanding is probably quite a few of the people in the audience here are social science people rather than, you know, nuclear physicists or something like that. And some things it's easier to pitch to people. You know, if you do work on string theory and quantum mechanics, it's kind of harder to pitch that to people, I think. But if you work on problems that have immediate real world connections, you know, if you work on nutrition or you work on climate change or something, then it's going to be easier to do that. But whatever you work on, you know, try and identify the level of the person that you're talking to and have your sort of, have your pitch pitched at them, you know, I think. Thank you. I'd also think about how you can um, phrase what you're what you're wanting to work on or what you're wanting to do in a way that makes it sound like interesting or or even a little bit mysterious, depending on the person that you're talking to. Like, how do you attract their attention? Um, By asking I, questions. Asking, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I would. I'd also add that. A lot of the time, it's quite easy to tell when someone isn't interested in what you're saying. Um, they people sometimes can tend to like look around the room a lot, looking for other people that they might want to know, looking like they're disengaged. Um, in those kinds of situations, I would recommend you kind of start looking at to terminate the conversation and move on to something else because if if they're not engaged, um, then they're, they're you're basically wasting your time. Um, no, I, I agree. Um, yeah, and in terms of, I mean, in terms of the kind of the elevator pitch model, um, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I tend to think of um, the, like the grant application pitch and the, um, and the, the um, I'm trying to capture someone's attention at a conference um, by telling them about my brilliant, fascinating research kind of pitch as 
is, is quite similar. Like they both involve, yeah, crystallizing something into, um, into a form that's like where the, the intervention is like incredibly clear and, and, um, and, and exciting. So I, yeah, I, I think um, it's not kind of, it's not wasted effort in that sense. Like it's um, being able to, being able to frame something for, for someone in a, in a social situation is, is going to serve you well in terms of your, your own kind of understanding of the research and what, you know, what, what its essence is and what's sort of like truly original and novel about it, I guess. I think that, I mean, I think just having, you know, being able to do it in a couple of sentences. And I think what James said was really interesting about the mystery, right? And I think, you know, often the way I, I mean, we work on how genes are switched on and switched off. And so to me, the pitch to people is always that you know, every cell in your body has the same blueprint. It has the same DNA. And yet, you know, you know that the cells in your brain do completely different things to the cells in your liver. You know, how does that happen? We don't really understand. And so, you know, just in a couple of sentences, that's kind of given the background and then given the question, you know, and hopefully in a form that most people would go, oh yeah, gee, that's kind of weird. You know, how on earth does that happen? And then you kind of, well, you've either hooked people or like James said, they're looking around the room, you know, you know where the bar the bar. You don't want to be friends with them. You don't want to be friends with them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks all. all. I should give you a contribution. Hey, okay. So it's gone a bit. Margaret, there's a bit of sound out of back in the microphone. You could mute that might be good. That's great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question they might want to throw in? Uh, yeah, I actually had a question. I don't know whether you can hear me. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so my experience in academia has been that uh, people respect you whether or not you're an extrovert or an introvert because there's this assumption that uh, regardless of what you are, you're going to be able to do your job. But then my experience has been in the private sector that it's quite different that unless you're out there, you know, talking about yourself, how good you are, it doesn't matter how well you're doing, uh, there's this tendency to think of you as somebody who's uh, not up to the job. And I've been wondering whether with all this talk about diversity and inclusion, whether we as introverts do have a role of actually saying, you know, actually we, we are okay, we can do the job as well as uh, anybody else. It's just that we work a little bit uh, differently. So I, I was uh, interested to hear, particularly for those of you in the, who have worked in the private sector, what your view of that is. Sounds like James. <laughs> um, that, that's a, a really good question. Um, and something that I think would would take quite a while to unpack and for me to process but on the just kind of off the top of my head um, I think we have to be careful about defining um, I guess behaviors in terms of introversion and um, extroversion um, they're not they're not a skill set right they're, they're the way that people have a tendency to behave and, and kind of the way that I understand or interpret introversion and extroversion is around um, the use of energy. So when you think of an extrovert and they go to a social event, they kind of suck up and get energy from that kind of environment. Whereas an introvert goes and they use up energy. And so at the end of the event, the extrovert is energized, feeling alive, whereas the introvert is just exhausted. I guess energy has been conserved, hasn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Another engineering principle. <laughs> um, and so, and so, with that, I don't, I don't think it, it really affects um, your ability to function in the workplace. It's just um, you might have to be uncomfortable for a little bit longer um, in, in, in terms of going to these kind of 
you're putting yourself into these situations where you are losing energy um, and, and giving it to extroverts. But that is not a, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase it. It's kind of, it's not a cost because you go home and you recharge. Like that's just how, how you recharge your energy. You're, you go home and you do the things that you enjoy, whether it's reading a book, um, being on your own or hanging out with your, your closer intimate friends. Um, and so it's, yeah, I, I, I'm not really making myself clear, am I? But I'm trying to uh, get across the idea that you shouldn't be bounded by introversion and extroversion, um, if you get what I mean. Uh, I guess it would depend on the kind of work that you're doing. I guess my biggest concern is this, there's this move uh, in a lot of companies in, in the private sector towards what they call uh, agile working, uh, co-designing, which inherently involves a lot of group work. Yeah. Which then uh, for for um, introverts, uh, you're right that it's, it's energy expenditure. So you end up uh, spending a whole lot of energy doing these tasks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would even suggest that, that your performance then gets affected, whereas if there was good balance of, um, of uh, mixed tasks, you know, uh, yeah. group and individual, it's, it's, a different, it's a different setting. So my concern really is not even uh, the work itself, but it's this perception that to be, able, to be able to do your job well, you have to be a certain kind of person. So that, that's what for me I'm thinking. Surely there must be a role for, for people to speak up and say, "Well, uh, yeah, it's it's not it's it's not a problem." You know, sort of trust yeah. the introverts to do their job as well as the extroverts as well. Well, I I would I can take that example that you've just said um, around co-design, um, user-centered design, and facilitating workshops. Like I've I've been involved and done that, um, and I, as I said before, am an introvert, and that hasn't prevented me from doing a good job from. Um, from interviewing people, from getting out sort of design requirements and trying to get to the root of what people's problems are. Um, it's just that at the end of it, I'm exhausted. But as I said, it's kind of an opportunity to go home and, and, and recharge afterwards. Um, and I guess I have, within my team, there are also extroverts and introverts, but there's a, a kind of a dynamic that allows us to... Um, I think I, I, I also think it's kind of reflective of leadership as well is allowing people to participate um, to the extent that they're comfortable with. Um, and that is extroverted people understanding that there are introverted people around um, and giving them time and space to contribute. Um, and I don't know about other industries because I'm, I'm only in a small startup now. Um, and we have a very close team with a, a combination of extroverts and introverts, but we we know each other well enough that this kind of um, dichotomy of extroverted and introversion is allowed to flourish. Um, the extroverts let the introverts participate when they want to. Um, and I think if more companies within, and I think more companies within the private and uh, private sector are kind of understanding that or... Well, that's what I think anyway from, from kind of all the other companies that I work with. A lot of emphasis is placed on developing healthy company culture. And the only way that you can do that is through inclusion. Um, so I, I don't know what I industry mean, uh, is in, but. It's, it's just, I'd be surprised if you could just lump all companies together and say, yeah, are bad at this, it's <laughs> good at this or vice versa or any, I mean, I think it's going to, like James says, depend massively on who's in charge and the way they run the operation. You know, I mean, it's all about, a lot of it is about having someone, the person that's, that's supervising or guiding the team, like James says, having, appreciating that people have different skills and, you know, being a good leader is about figuring out how how everyone operates and you know and getting everyone to operate the best they can in the environment so if you're in a place where people you know they're not interested in people that aren't kind of constantly beating their chest and then maybe it's not the best place to be thanks all you had a question yeah for Joel. yeah it's a little bit critical um 
I'm just wondering, um, I understand the importance of networking in, in the private sector, in the for-profit organizations. But sometimes I think um, we hype networking so much in the academia and somehow it could be detrimental to um, the flourishing of the academia. So I, I give a personal experience. Um, I finished my master's like two years ago, three years ago. And I've got like two master's. And then there is this uh, project in Denmark about why migrants are not able to get into the mainstream academia. I mean, without the research work, we understand that major problem is the language and networking. You need to create a network and then you need to speak the language. So um, there's this professor who got this project from the EU. So when the project was publicized, I wrote her, you have a fantastic project. I'm this, these are my qualifications, blah, blah, blah. And this is the project I want to do. And it fits well into what you want to do. And then she replied me in just a single line. Hi, Valentine. You know any of my students or my colleagues who can talk about you? Um, so it ended up that the importance of that project wasn't, or someone who was going to participate in that project wasn't your credentials or what you're able to offer or what you're going to do in the project. It's more about who do you know, who, who can link you to me, who can tell you about me. And so I spent like three years trying to do networking to get into a PhD. But I realized I was able to get it because I was resilient. But perhaps the others who are better than me, but who are not as resilient as myself, who couldn't sustain the tempo of networking for three years just to get into the academia. And now that I've gotten in, I see it's, it's even more, there's more networking. So I'm just asking, do we really need so much networking in the academia for people to get to where they need to be? Do we think it's very, very important? It's important in the public sector, private sector, but is it important in the academia? Um, I mean, I think it's really, really important uh, in my, you know, in science at least. I mean, one, in, I mean, at, at, at all, at so many different levels, right? I mean, one thing I, when I was stalking Pansy online, I noticed that her, uh, you know, her last few publications that she has on her, on her website, uh, she's the only author on those publications. And, you know, that's clearly a reflection of the type of work she does, the field that she's in, and, the, you know, the way that the field operates, is that people sit down, they think about stuff, they presumably they talk to some other people about the stuff, but then they write something that's just, it's their view, their uh, critique, their analysis of, of something. If you look at the papers that I publish, you know, they've all got 15 people on them. And so, and some of those people are people in my own lab, but usually about half of those people are people in other labs. So in other countries or in the same country, they could be anywhere. And so for my work to be successful, at least my mode of operation is that I make networks with people who have complementary skills to me. They're interested in the same basic problem, but they have different skill sets. And, you know, almost every one of the papers I've published uses not just my skill set, but uses the skill sets from these collaborators. So, you know, my work is basically totally built on, on collaborations with, uh, with other groups. So that's one aspect in which networks are, are really important, in science at least. You know, as I say, I can't speak for other fields. Um, I mean, there's so many obvious things like the people that are going to review your grant applications or your papers or who might possibly recommend you if they're organizing a conference, they might recommend you to give a talk on, or at, a, at a meeting. People discussing who should be on a committee to do this or a panel to do that. I mean, they, your name can only ever be considered for anything if people have heard of you and they're more likely to consider it you if they've met you and even more likely if they've met you and they actually liked talking to you. So, and all of those things are things that end up on your CV. I refereed these papers. I was awarded this grant. I sat on this panel, all of those things. 
And all of those things only happen if you have networks of, of people. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I don't know, at least, you know, in the situation that I'm in, I would be a far, far poorer scientist if it was just me squirreling away in, in my own lab with a couple of people. I think we also probably all recognize that while network connections are important, it's almost inescapable that there is a whole set of um, recognized and unrecognized biases that people have but on in the most benign sense it might be um, I'm a bloke I'm happy to have a beer at the pub with another bloke that's a network connection that gets developed but a female colleague who I might not feel as comfortable with saying should we go down the pub for a drink that might be a connection that never gets developed and I'm sure there are a whole set of other ones that you could link to racialized and um, sort of gender-based, sex-based, the whole set of axes of difference. So I think that's a kind of thorny issue that it's difficult to address from the individual's perspective because they're baked into the social system. Is that, are you suggesting that elements of that may? No, may no not, not really. I'm like saying if, if, yeah, I understand maybe the kind of work is doing, you need to be collaborative. Like um, you, can't, you can't do much of the scientific, pure science work mm -hmm. without being collaborative, but like in the arts or social sciences, um, I think if you give so much emphasis on networking, then um, the Esther of us and those who've got wonderful social skills, not necessarily the wonderful academic skills, they tend to climb the ladder faster than, mm -hmm. than others. I think that is some kind of doom <coughs> for the academia. Um, the emphasis should be more on uh, what people are able to do and produce without what you're able to do to connect to people somehow um it might not work in the pure sciences but i would think within all that kind of discipline i think that should be more of the emphasis it's not really um how you're able to get across everybody being more social being extroverted and stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah it appears that at the early career stage where you don't have a whole bank of publications that people might know you for that those problems are all the more acute. Yeah. Whereas at the higher career stage, you can be completely unsociable, but you've got a fantastic book that everyone knows. <laughs> and everyone knows about. Where I think it's the things that you're describing are sort of particularly difficult at that early career stage, where all you are relying on is your ability to connect with other people. You might not have any papers out. Or anything like that. Yeah, it's a thorny issue. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question they might want to pose? Yes, I, I have. Um, I'm Karen Nian, based here at a, Otago University, and I've really enjoyed the panel. And I'm one of the facilitators for the early career postgraduate panel, and it's great to have this as part of that, that program, and along with the Royal Society. And one of the things that struck me as I was listening to each of you is, because I'm someone who um, uses interviewing as part of my data collection and work with lots of postgrads who are planning to do interviews, that lots of what you're talking about actually applies for social science interviewing skills. And I suppose one of the things that I was struck by, because I've worked with um, young people as researchers in high schools as well, and I remember um, inviting peer researchers and one of the ones who was most successful as an interviewer like initially um, I thought oh she seemed very quiet and wasn't I wasn't sure how she was going to um, to operate but actually she collected the most elaborated data because I think she was such an effective listener and um, and so I think there's there's some real value in you know, what you've talked about today actually applying across to those researchers who have to think about um, interviewing people and that, you know, being an extrovert <laughs> um, might not necessarily, I know you have to kind of put yourself out there to meet people and, and, and establish rapport, but that, um, that there can be some advantages in being an introvert in that um, setting as well. And I just wanted to see if anyone had any comments about that. I think it's your turn, Pansy. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Oh, you're on mute, Pansy. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um. Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I do, I, 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 as I was saying, and when I was talking, like, I do think um, introversion, if not, um, if not ha has a sort of set of um, inbuilt ad advantages, then goes hand in hand with things that are advantageous, um, particularly in my field, the humanities, um, I work in, as Joel was sort of indicating, um, we tend to value the, you know, the monograph or the, um, the sole author journal article. And, and so, yeah, if you're if you're a, a quiet, introverted person, you you know you're 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 capable, and in fact, enjoy spending like extended periods of your time alone in a room with some books, which is like. Um, so I think yeah, there are definite advantages in that sense. But um, yeah, also just just that I think one of the things that's it, it's taken me a while to to figure out in terms of socialising is that um a lot of it is just um you know socialising specifically at these kind of big um professional events is that a lot of it is just kind of turning up there's there's it's 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 not about performing or d necessarily delivering you know a, a, a kind of witty anecdote or a great memorable story or a, like a brief, <coughs> just about being there um so i think if, you know when, when you sort of let go of this idea that you need to kind of um you know create a certain impression and 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 um a more comfortable just kind of going with the flow I think things things get easier for you I think partly because academics are a lot more um forgiving and accepting um as I as I was as I was sort of indicating then then you would expect because so many of them are also introverts and kind of like awkward and nerdy and and sort of self-involved and so that you know they're not um uh expecting you expecting much of you other than just that you're you're there um so yeah, in terms of yeah, the advantages of introversion. Um, yeah, other people might have something to to say to that. What about you and um, Joel and Joel and Jan? I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut the conversation short. I'd like to go on. I'm sure we could go on for a long time. But your comments, Pansy, I'm taking that as embrace your introvert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wear it with pride. Um, use it to its advantages. And I'd just like to say, Pansy, Joel, James, thank you very much for being involved today and for your insights. It was much appreciated on behalf of the audience. Um, very much enjoyed it. And thank you everyone for tuning in from wherever you are around the country or in Sydney, if you're Joel. And hopefully you can um, stay abreast of the other ESOC Sci early career seminars that will be rolling out in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much, everyone, and have an afternoon.